really excited today to have a new friend as my guest for our podcast today, Ruth McKinney. And um, we've had a spectacular day. Oh, it's been already. fantastic. Uh -huh. Yeah, this is, uh, we could have kind of said this is live from uh, the garden market, Wheezy's Garden mm -hmm. Market. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've had a great day, yep. just barely beat the rain. So Ruth has been here with my wife, Wheezy, uh, displaying her artwork and Ruth's book candles. Mm -hmm. And so we've, uh, I feel like we've begun a, a new friendship. friendship. Uh, it is, it's yeah. great. We just had a great conversation mm -hmm. upstairs mm -hmm. and uh, I'm so actually excited mm -hmm. to see where God might take this yeah. going forward. So I'm so excited to have Ruth here to share her story mm -hmm. and her love and her passion that that come through in this incredible book, Hungry for Home, which we'll hold up here in a minute for those who are watching by YouTube. But um, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I'm honored and privileged. Thank you. Uh, oh, well, it's fantastic. Well, uh, I feel like your book, Hungry for Home, is like the uh, perfect embodiment of what this podcast, mm -hmm. Space for Life, is all about. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, the most literal um, understanding of space for life is a space that creates life. Right. And that's what so much of Hungry for Home mm. is all about, is how can we create a physical space, but something that's much more than a physical yeah. space um, that brings life in mm. all of its form for ourselves and for all whom we encounter. So I feel like uh, you're bringing the uh, the the artistry, mm -hmm. in essence, behind Space for Life to this podcast. So I'm really excited about having this conversation. It's a whole nother nuance to the types of thing that we talk about on Space I for Life. It. Thank you. So it'll be great. So I want to just start off by uh, your story is both wild and amazing. <laughs> yeah. It has been a story. So, yeah. And it's still unfolding, so it's exciting to see what God's doing. Well, and and I kind of feel a little bit of a resonance because my story is also mm -hmm. wild and makes no sense, Yeah, and yours doesn't either. No. So anyway, I thought I'd just give you a uh, chance to Yeah. Thank you. And, and even when people ask me, you know, where are you going from here? My answer doesn't make sense to them, right? Because it's Holy Spirit led, which is very different than what most people, you know, think. What's your business plan? Where are you headed? You know, do you have you thought through it all? And I'm kind of like, well, I'm watching the Lord unfold it right before my own eyes as well. So, well, and that is really clear as you tell your story. So, <laughs> so, so go back as far as you okay. want, and uh, yeah, I'd love to hear it again. Oh, wonderful. Well, I lived in Richmond, Virginia. Actually, even before then, I was an assistant Commonwealth attorney in Chesapeake, Virginia. From there, I went to Richmond where I was at the attorney general's office. So I was an assistant attorney general there and got married. And my husband and I moved up to Philadelphia. And we didn't have any money. We hadn't sold our house in Richmond. Actually, and he's a gentleman you know, but he was one of my mentors and he had taken me to lunch because my husband was going to go work for a family company. And at our lunch, Judge Lemons put in front of me in the center of the table a magazine, the Newsweek magazine, that had to do with companies passing down generationally. And my husband was going to go work for his father's business. And he said, do you know what you're giving up and what you're heading into? So that was kind of the beginning because that it was a tumultuous beginning. You know, we lived our first year in Philadelphia. We lived in nine places in one year. And my husband and I just went from house to house with whoever would put us up for a while. We didn't really have any means at the time. I wasn't working. I was waiting to wave into the bar in Pennsylvania. And uh, so that started it and that there was no sense of, you know, home at that time. So you left really an amazing, yes. prestigious yes. job to uh -huh. move north with your husband to to I don't emptiness. know what yes and it's interesting i'll never forget i was talking to my mom as i was crying driving up and i said what have i done and my mom said oh you've lived in a bubble i'm excited to see what the how the lord stretches you 
And the okay. next two decades have been incredible stretching. Yeah. So that I've both been grateful. And it's so fun to be back here in Richmond where it all started. Oh, it's, it's great. And, and even though I was born here in Richmond and lived in, we have so many common mm-hmm. connections. We do. Our paths never crossed. Never. During, Isn't that crazy? And it's that. a small world in Richmond. So, yeah. I yeah. Know. So we get up to, we got up to um, Pennsylvania and I was doing a small Bible study outside of Wayne, outside of Philadelphia. And I told my husband, this is where I'd like to buy a house. So we went and met with a realtor. She asked us how much we could afford. And we told her and she burst out laughing in the middle of our conversation. And for anybody who's a realtor, I highly advise you never do that. She said, you can't afford to live here. And that was the end of our meeting. Two weeks later, she called and she said, are you afraid of hard work? And uh, I didn't know what she meant by that. Um, My husband's not afraid of what she meant by that. So we went out. She took us to, there's something called the Montgomery Estate. If you've ever seen the movie, The Philadelphia Story, uh, it was based off of the Montgomery family and Montgomery Estate. But there's these little, they're called banjo houses that are on the property that the help used to live in. And she took us to one of those homes that was sliding off the foundation. And it was about 150 years old. She said, you can afford this. So my husband and I, I have a newly born at that time, went to a diner and I sat and cried. And I said, there's no way. It has one bathroom. It it literally was like slide it. And he said, let's go to Home Depot and learn. Um, 18 months later, we found out what we could sell it for, which was double. We sold it and we began to realize we had a knack for something. So when, when he said, let's learn, mm-hmm. this wasn't in his wheelhouse. Oh, either. no, 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 no. He's it's- an engineer. What is in his wheelhouse is he has no fear of failure. And I think, you know, I learned that very quickly when we were in Richmond and he had his house here. I had mentioned I wanted a new kitchen. And I went to work that day and I came home. The kitchen was gone. The floor was up and he had all this concrete on the ground. And I I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm laying a floor and we're going to build a kitchen. I said, well, I'm hungry. Let's go to dinner. Now, meanwhile, he has put concrete all over the floor. We go to dinner and we go home. It had hardened. (laughs) So there's no tile on it. And it is not hardened onto a slab. It is hardened onto plywood. And anyone who's ever done construction knows it will never come off. You can't. So my husband had to, with a painstakingly, with a knife and a, a hammer, chisel off the entire floor. So when I say we're not afraid of failure, my husband's really not afraid of failure. So, and the Lord has, um, it's happened in every house. There's a different story, but he just starts again. And that's a unique ability. It's really mm-hmm. unique. Yeah. One I absolutely do not do not share. <laughs> Neither does my mom. And it was funny. My dad said at one point, he said, if I have to hear Bob's name one more time from your mother. And I was like, just because he would do anything. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So we bought this house and and again, we flipped it in 18 or 24 months and we started to do it. We did it every year for 16 or 17 years. We moved every year and a half to two years and we had five children. All five were born in different homes, and we did the work ourselves. So whoever, if our home didn't have a kitchen at the time, whoever took a shower had to wash the dishes in the bathtub. So it just, it's just we did life that way. So, which is is really ironic to me. Here you had this whole long period of time mm-hmm. that you lived in so many uh, houses, mm-hmm. and yet then it comes all the way around to this hungry for home and the story mm-hmm. of where you live now mm-hmm. and the home you built, it's 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 almost uh, an oxymoron that you would do all of this flipping yeah. and then... And then this is what I... Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I grew up moving all, a lot. And what I realized was my connection and my sense of home wasn't about the house itself and the four walls, but it was what my parents had created in family. Mm. And in the home itself. And I thought, okay. Um, And later in my story, I'll get where the the name comes from. But home and family culture is what I'm passionate about. And so, um, but you know, all through this time from leaving the practice of law to living at home, I'll never forget, you know, 
Women, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak to women because I don't know about men per se, but women go through different identity shifts of where they're like, who am I? The first one for me was leaving the practice of law. Actually, Elaine Metcalf, who you know, yes. she had taken my husband out. They were, um, they knew each other well, and she said, Ruth's going to have an identity crisis. And he said, my wife? No, 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 no. She knows she wants to be a stay-at-home mom. We, we already know the drill. Like, she's ready to do this. And she said, oh, no, it's coming. And I'll never forget, after my first daughter had been born, she, <laughs> I called my husband at the office. She had been born with a thumb in her mouth. And I mean, I had put socks on her fingers, gloves, spray, anything to stop her. And I called him and I, I was in tears and I said, she's going to ruin her teeth. We're going to need bridges for her mouth. And he was silent on the phone. And I said, well, Bob, are you listening? And he said, who are you? And I said, what are you talking about? Are you not listening to me? He said, what have you done with my wife? And I just started to cry. And I said, oh my gosh, my world has shrunk to the size of a thumb. That is who I am. And, and it was that sense of, okay, all that sense of productivity and, and purpose had left. And here we were basically living out of suitcases, months in, months out, with no sense of, um, yeah, space or place. Um, so we moved for 16 years, and my second identity crisis hits, which is when this book was born. Mm. Okay. Okay. Tell, tell so I'll tell off. you this story. And this is where the story gets, for me, um, more personal, I think, as far as recent. Um, I have an uncle who is visiting me, and he calls me into my living room onto this pink couch I have, which will come into my story later. And he said, have a seat. And so I have a seat. And he said, I have a question for you. And I said, okay. He said, Ruth, what are you 100% dependent on the Lord for right now? I said, what do you mean right now? Like, right now? And he said, yes. And I said, uh, raising my five kids. And he said, beyond that. And I said, nothing. And he said, that's a problem. He said, you and Bob have gotten so good at what you do and providing for yourself. Where is the space and ability to see God work beyond you? And he said, so I have a challenge for you. And he knew exactly what I needed to hear because I love challenges. And he said, my challenge is for you is ask the Lord to give you a vision beyond your resources beyond your financial means, your personal capital, and your education. So you get to see him work, and he gets the glory, not you. So at this same time, my eldest had just left for college, and literally, I can't explain why. I still had four kids at home, but I felt the earth shifting underneath me. Like, who am I going to be? They're all going to leave me. And then I'm still going to have you know, 20 or 30 more years. What is that going to look like? And really an unsettledness of that second identity shift. And at the same time, he's challenging me to pray this prayer. Well, about a couple of months later, I had attended a conference up in Connecticut called um, By Women Doing Well, and it was on what's your purpose, plan, and passion. And I thought this will be interesting. So there's a couple hundred people. And I, I'm now on the board of Women Doing Well, so <laughs> it's all come full circle. But I'm at this event, and I'm at this event with um, some dear friends, one of whom is Sally Lloyd-Jones, who wrote the storybook Bible, who's a dear friend, and, and some other women who are just rock stars in their areas of expertise. And there was a panel of women um, who were all leaving their areas of, you know, business, they had just business acumen, just different la layers and areas of expertise to go into ministry. And one had made the statement, I can do a spreadsheet in my sleep, but I don't even know how to do a cheese board. And I get in the car with one of my friends. A the, cheese board. A cheese board. You know, a charcuterie yeah. board. Okay. And um, I don't even know why that combination was said, but I get in the car and I'm with my best friend, Heather, and I just start crying. And I said, I don't have a purpose because the whole thing had to do with what's your purpose, plan, and passion. Right. I don't have a purpose beyond my family. I don't have a passion beyond how do you bless people in and through your home, but what would God ever do with that? And I definitely don't have a plan. And she goes, well, at least you know how to make a cheese board. And it, it literally, it became like that point of levity in the car. So if you ever get the book and you see it, when you open, the first thing you're going to see is a charcuterie board. That's so great. I just, anyway, now going back to my story. So I go home, I'm continuing to pray that vision beyond my resources, vision beyond my resources. About two months later, I'm invited to another conference in DC. Didn't want to go. Um, it's a women of legacy conference. It was a museum of the Bible and I'm driving down 
And I'm in ripped jeans, tank top, flip-flops, and I'm like, I don't belong at this event. And I walk in, all the women had gathered the night before in the hotel just to have drinks together, and I plop down next to this woman who is beautiful and regal, and I just thought, what am I doing here? And she and I start to talk, and she starts to cry. And she said, you're my divine appointment. And I was like, for what? And she said, I was supposed to meet you. I told the Lord I had to meet I had, he had to have somebody I was supposed to talk with. Well, we her name was Sarah, Sarah Perot. And I asked her permission to say her name. Um, but mm. two months later, after this meeting, I host a wedding of about 300 people on our property. And I get chronic migraines. And I'm laying in my kitchen on the floor. And my husband's rubbing my head. And my phone starts to beep. And I said, who is it? And he said, it's Sarah Perot she'd like you to fly to London tomorrow. And I burst out laughing and I said, I don't fly to London tomorrow. I don't fly next week. I was like, I have five kids. And I, that's just not the way I, you know. So he said, you who haven't does even, that? who does that? <laughs> and he said, you haven't even prayed about this. And I was like, so he prayed. And her next text was, I'm bringing you here. I'd like you to come. So I came two days later. Our other friend, Sally Lloyd-Jones came as well. And I was there for a week. On one of the days, she took us to a little farm in the Cotswolds. It was her favorite farm for lunch. This is all going somewhere, I promise. And we're having lunch, and they were just trying to get to know me and ask about the flipping houses. I don't. I think they didn't really know what to do with someone like myself. And they said, "Do you even unpack your boxes? I mean, why unpack your boxes? You're going to move in 18 months." And I said. Well, you have to. Everyone's hungry for home. They both pick up their computers at this luncheon, and one says to the other, it hasn't been taken. And the other one says, no, it hasn't. And I said, what hasn't? And they said, you're supposed to write a book. I said, I'm not writing a book. <laughs> I have nothing to say. I'm not writing a book. In fact, I can't think of anything less I'd like to do. I have a lot of family members <coughs> who have written books and family members that books have been written about. And at our family reunions, we have to take a table out for all their books. And I always laugh and I'm like, oh, we got your table. You know what I mean? So uh. it just wasn't something in my lane. It wasn't something I felt qualified or capable of doing, let alone that I had something to say. And uh, so we leave that, I leave that time in London. I go home and my sister walks over. She lives on our property in one of our guest houses. And she walks over and says, how was it? And I said, you're going to laugh. They think I need to write a book. Well, my sister starts crying, and she said, I think you're supposed to do it. I said, I have nothing to say. I'm never writing a book. So she said, okay, you're, you're too quick to answer. Would you be willing to speak with a friend of mine in California who's an author? And just because I did say I'd be willing to put all my family recipes into a, a cookbook for the kids when they get married. So I call her friend named Jess. We have a long conversation on the phone. She said, this is bigger than your family. May I fly out there next week? I said, you're welcome to, but I'm not by, I'm not writing a book. So she flies out. She spends a few days with our family. And at the end of that time, she says, I'd like to collaborate. It's bigger than you. And I said, I'm not writing a book. And she, so she, I'm sitting on that. You're, okay, now you're I a little to, stubborn, aren't uh, you? Well, it's, it's more like <laughs> I couldn't think of anything I'd even less like to do, let alone yeah. I, I have nothing to say. You know, any, so I'm going to wrap this part of the story up to explain it, but I'm sitting on that same pink couch and she walks in with my sister. They had been out shopping all day at different gardening stores and cooking stores and Barnes and Noble. And she walks in with two wrapped presents and she hands me the first one and I unwrap it and it's a teapot. And she said, Ruth, every time you're asking for the Lord to give you that vision beyond your resources, I want you to have a cup of tea. And I started laughing, and I said, I don't drink tea, and I'm not writing a book. So she said, okay, well, before you open your second gift, I looked all over town. We spent all day shopping, and I thought, if, if Ruth ever did a book, what would it look like or be like? And I thought, this will be interesting. I opened the book, and I mean, it's quiet. And I just said, where is this? And she said, I don't know. We flipped to the back of the book, and it's the farm outside of London, in the Cotswolds. They had had no idea where I had been. And I'm telling you, Tommy, I, I, I burst into tears. I mean, I could cry even just talking about it 
because I knew the Lord was saying you're to be obedient regardless. Mm-hmm. And you've been praying for that vision beyond your resource. This is beyond. It's beyond what you're you're able to do. It's beyond your area of expertise and education. You don't even know anyone who can make this come to pass for you. So I said, okay, I'll be obedient. And I said, but I don't know what to do. And Jessica was standing there and she said, okay, I'm going to put, I'm going to put an app on your phone every Monday for six months. She sent me a list of questions. I would sit with my phone, talk into my phone, answering the questions, telling the stories, and it would transcribe onto her computer. And then we'd work together. Well, COVID hit. And I thought, how am I going to photograph this? A friend of mine is a photographer. She's like, I'll come over. She came over five times. She took 33,000 photos, which is why so many beautiful ones are captured in the book. And she culled that down to about, oh, 1,500. And then my husband brought home two stacks of the manuscript. And my sister and I sat at the dining room table cutting and pasting where we thought everything should go. So this is now, now we're, now we're at Labor Day weekend. So this has now been nine months in process. And a friend, another friend that you know, Wendy Rogers, puts me on a phone call with the gentleman who wrote Purpose Driven Life with Rick Warren. And we're on a Zoom call and he's just giving me counsel. And he said, okay, what's your Instagram like? What's your Facebook like? I said, I don't have any. Oh, I hate those questions. I hate it. I remember that was one of the most dawning, discouraging. Oh, well, I literally didn't even when have I was it. Writing, yeah. yes. Mm-hmm. And he said, "Here's your problem, Ruth. The industry, the publishing industry, has shrunk to such a degree that unless you can prove you have a social engine behind you for marketing purposes, or whether you're, or if you're a household name, no one's going to touch you. Mm-hmm. You need to self-publish." And I. I said, oh, well, then I'm done. So I hang up the phone. My husband's sitting next to me. And I said, guess what, sweetie? I want you to put these in a three-ring binder. We're giving them for Christmas. I'm done. I'm not self-publishing. I wouldn't even know what to, let alone how do I sell them. He goes, you know, you're so quick to do this. Why aren't you praying about this? And I said, because I'm done. And he said, you know what? I think my new paddle partner, who's from South Africa, I think he has a printing company. Let me call him. So he picks up the phone. He calls Michael. He said, do you do books? Michael's like, I don't know if we do books. He calls him right back. He said, we do books. I'll have it ready in six weeks, and I will do it at cost for Ruth. The Lord literally was like, you want vision beyond your resources? You can't take credit for anything, nothing, not even your quick obedience because you weren't quickly obedient. You can take quick (laughs) credit for nothing. And guess what? Where it's going is going to be because I take it there not because you do. And so it's been such a wonderful story for me to sit there and go, the Lord has something to say through me, even though I wasn't aware of it. You know, someone, I was just on Bob Goff's podcast as you know, and um, he said something interesting. He said, you know, it was something so familiar to you that you don't realize other people don't have it. Right. So how many stories do we each have that we, we downplay or discount? And we don't understand how important they are to be told. And it's so much the story often behind identifying and finding and discovering your purpose is that it's those things that come so easily, easily to us that you think there is nothing special about it. Anybody could do Anyone it. Anyone can do this. But yet that's the very sign yeah. that this is something unique that God has done. And well, even when I speak, you know, people say, is it hard for you? And I'm like, I'm just telling what God did in my life. Like that's as natural to me as breathing. If you were to tell me to go teach on, you know, this, I I might not, it wouldn't go so well. So yeah, that's exactly. And, you know, Bob also mentioned something that I love. I'm going to start integrating it when I talk about it, but was the curating of things in your home for purposes of influencing those who come in through your home, not, not controlling them or or changing them, but influencing in a way that you're, and that's what my heart has been, is Mm. how, you know, to your point on the book, so what we ended up doing, because I don't think anyone needs another cookbook or another decorating book or a gardening book, there's a lot, and I'm not an expert in any of those, but what I do have a heart for is blessing people in and through your home, and how do you use your home to do that? So how do you, you know, intentionally have a family culture that's healthy. 
Um, I think we live in a fractured nation and our homes are fractured. And so how do you curate for, right. you know, for that work? Or how do you just intentionally create it? One of my friends said, I don't, we don't have a family culture. I was like, oh, yes, you do. You just haven't been intentional about creating it, which means it might not be very good. You know? Right. So how so that, do you yeah. curate it? So that's what the book is. We took our farm because we landed, and I didn't get to this part of the story, but we have a 305-year-old farmhouse. It was deeded by William Penn. We're the fourth people on the deed. So each family's held it for 100 years, and we restored it. But we took that farm over the course of 100, I mean, over the course of a year, and documented family traditions, family recipes, gardening, decorating, and entertaining. And then how you use each one of those things to be a blessing through your home. Hmm. So that's the book. Yeah, well, and, and it's so great, and I love that idea of curating because, in a sense, I feel like that's what I hope this podcast is. It's just yeah. curating, it's just creating space for stories yeah. to be told that can Influence. encourage people mm -hmm. to a different way of being yeah. and a different way of living, whether it's you know bringing on a guest like yourself mm -hmm. or or things that I teach about, and it's just creating that different voice I love it for for things to be heard yeah. so your your story and it it's funny I, this is kind of a reintroduction of the podcast space for life because I took a year off which okay. you know is in there but it feels like in almost every episode that I've had so far mm -hmm. the same verse has come from proverbs has come to the forefront and it it's an exact description of your story. It's from mm -hmm. Proverbs 19. It said, man makes his plans, yeah. but it's the Lord's purposes that mm -hmm. prevail. Mm -hmm. And so we do everything we can to figure things out. Yeah. And nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong but with that. But it's like something much, much bigger is going on, and it will happen. Even if it's in spite of us, yeah. it will happen. And your story is just so clearly that of, you know, the the people yeah. randomly I can't into even your life. since then I cannot even tell you who has come through my life and and offered speaking opportunities or or podcasts such as yourself and only the Lord brought them you know because I didn't reach out I don't I don't even know how to reach out again I'm a stay at home mom in Pennsylvania and so yeah. you're like Lord you know, I sit there in bed going, don't let my fears and insecurities or my hopes and dreams get in your way because it's all a big hot mess. And I I need him to direct where it's going. I don't trust myself well yeah. enough to do so it. So say say that sentence again slower. Oh. Because I think that's a that that just captures so much. Yeah. So Please. don't let my hopes and dreams or my fears and insecurities get in your way. Yeah. Because it's all a big hot mess. Both, both are so capable yes. of getting in both. the way of what we're meant, our fears and yeah. insecurities and our hopes or and dreams. our ego-based hopes yes. and dreams. Yes. So, and mm. I know that. That's why, you know, sometimes people come up with the word for the year that they feel the Lord's impressed upon them. Mine, I kind of, it's a sentence, but I feel expectant without expectations, mm, which I think great. for me has been an important place to be. I'm expectant for what the Lord has, but I don't have an expectation of what that looks like. Right. And um, so that's where I'm at. Oh, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. So I want to go back to what was your uncle that, mm -hmm. that uh, made that statement when I heard that the first time, I mm -hmm. think listening to your story on maybe a, another podcast, the thought that came to my mind, because I'm a very analytical, mm -hmm. um, structured, intentional planned person was how do you distinguish between something that's bigger than yourself mm -hmm. outside of your own resources uh, and something that's foolhardy and uh, just flat out crazy? Crazy. So for me, I think because number one, I was praying it, so already... Mm -hmm. I'm asking the Lord for that. Number two, it wasn't something I wanted to do. Okay. So that mm -hmm. very thing, um, I knew then I was supposed to step into it. It wasn't something that I dreamed up for myself, or nor did I feel like I had the ability or bandwidth to do it. 
So it seemed to have checked every box. And I'm telling you, even that first initial step of obedience, I have watched God work in a way I could not have done myself. So uh, one of the things I'm kind of curious about is when these wild, crazy things were happening to you, someone saying, fly out to London, and then someone saying, you need to write a book. Did it linger in the back of your mind, this prayer that you were saying? I didn't make the connection immediately because it was something I did not want to do. So I was thinking it would be something that I would love. Do you know what I'm saying? Like this to me was, um, again, I still didn't feel like I had something to say or anything to offer. I didn't see how it was possible. So I did not make that connection. Okay. Um, once things began to move the photography and again, when I found out I'd have to self publish, I was like, okay, the Lord just wanted to see, will she obey me? Maybe that was the purpose of the entire thing was faith and walking through that. Um, and I just had to see my husband sat there and said, he's, he also his word promises to finish his, that's what that, uh, he finished that, what, which I can't even speak. He promises to finish what he starts. Yeah. Don't you think he's going to finish this? It's not been an exercise just to see if you're going to do it. So I think that's been the whole thing, even as far as going forward, when people say, well, what's the next step? The Lord's going to do it. Um, It's just I have to be ready and available. And so that's what I've said I am. So Mm. That's great. Yeah, And even though... In a sense, many times you weren't ready and available. Yeah. You were resistant. Resistant. Mm-hmm. You, God still had the things to do in you yeah. and then through you too. Well, and part of it I'm I'm learning isn't just about the women or the people or the men it touches, but it's been about me. Yes. I totally, yeah. totally agree. It's you know, the the process of whether it's, you know, writing a book which a lot of that for me was very, very Personal. similar mm-hmm. to the uh, the barriers yeah. that you know I encountered in trying to do that, and and many times you know is this really worth it? Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to be hard. It might just utterly fail yeah. to a podcast. It's so much about the things that I feel like that God has done in me yep. in the process. Maybe even so much more than Maybe what he's done through. One thousand percent. And then, and then that even snowballs as you begin mm-hmm. to understand and believe and see time and time again mm-hmm. how God steps up. If we can say it that way, yeah. it, it starts to change, and you you can become expecting. Yeah. Excited, like mm-hmm. wow! What's coming? What's next? Yeah. What's right around the corner? And it's about the one. It's about that one person. You know, I, I delivered a book to somebody who ordered. It. I didn't know it was the second book that they had. And I walk up to the table. I mean, to the door, and they were probably in their seventies. And he said, "Oh my goodness, you're the author." And I said, "I'm just down the road. I am a housewife." <laughs> and he said, "Come in and meet my wife." Well, she walks in and she just bursts into tears. And I said, "Are you okay?" And she said, "No." I've lost who I am. We just downsized. We, you know, our children are grown. Who am I? And she said, can I show you where I read your book in the morning? Can I show you what my guest room looks like now? Because you've given me a vision for what I have to do. And Mm. I just thought, Lord, I wouldn't have known I would touch a 70-year-old woman or a woman who's single in California who reached out to me or a divorced mom who's lost hope on how to be a mother and to not despise those small beginnings. It could be about the one. Right. And, you know, that's not necessarily yeah. how we go into these things. No, and it seems trite and uh, a yep. little bit unbelievable, but when you experience someone engaging yeah. and being affected, it is really like, if it's just that one, If it's, it's just enough. that one. I, yeah. I'll tell one quick story. I, I had written a book out, you know, I signed them and I misspelled the woman's name. So I had to go do another one and I get home and my husband's like, what's this book for? And I said, I misspelled this woman's name. He was like, oh great, another wasted book. And I stuck it in my office and I was asked a few months later to speak at a Bible study at the church. And I said, sure. And I felt something nudging me saying, bring the book. 
the one you misspelled a name. And I, was, I, 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 I didn't do it. I get in my car. It was pouring rain. I felt that nudge, go get the book. I was like, I get the book. I put it in my car, put it in my briefcase. I go, I speak to this group of women. There was a woman sitting next to me, probably in her early 30s. She had nose rings, earrings, tattoos. I thought, she is definitely not getting me. You know what I mean? Like, we are not in the same, like, she's probably thinking, who is this lady and what kind of book is this? And so at the end, the pastor's wife takes over to do her part of the of the speaking. And I just felt the Lord say, get the book out. I said to the pastor's wife, can I interrupt you for a minute? I'm supposed to ask a question. I take out the book and I said, does anyone name known someone named Sarah? But it's spelled and I said the, the, the way I had spelled it. And everyone looks at the tattooed girl next to me. She starts to cry and she said, that's my name. And I said, you're supposed to have this book. And I handed it to her and she said, you know, I was sitting here thinking, how could I possibly get that book? I don't have enough money to buy the book. And I thought, God, you cared about the girl with the tattoos sitting next to me at that Bible study, enough that I misspelled a name months before and brought it. So to me, it's each of those moments where you're like, Lord, thank yeah. you for not letting me miss those things, waiting for something big. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. It's about these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, it's the best. It's the best. It's the best of yep. all. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I want to uh, shift gears yeah. a little bit because they're, you know. Time limitations uh, too, I'm sure. <laughs> I know, as I talk forever. Not with me. You've got okay. the long drive. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear just a little bit more about uh, your partnership with your husband Bob. because it's it sounds really amazing, which is, of course, often hard for people to hear because they're in relationships that aren't really amazing. But it's not just from everything you've told me, mm -hmm. it's not just you and mm -hmm. you're making this book happen and you're making this home. It's like it would have never, never. happened. Never. And so it's at some sense, it's the two of you mm -hmm. doing something of which you're in a particular role in it and he is so uh how does that how does that play out yeah i mean heard a little bit about how it has played how does it continue to play out wow i think i'm married to the greatest man on earth i really do and it's not just because he serves his family so well he loves us so well and i think you know even when it has to do with this family culture we come from very different types of families and he has been willing you know when we read as a family, we read about four nights a week as a family uh, out loud. I grew up doing that, and we've kind of implemented that in our own family. He's not the one that reads. I do. Because he wouldn't even – he he doesn't um, – he didn't grow up that way, but he can appreciate what it has formed in our family. So who he – he is probably my biggest cheerleader. Um you know, speaking back to the Metcalfs that we mentioned at the beginning, when we first got married, they said, we have some advice for you. They said, go away once or twice a year and talk about your marriage and talk about your children. Begin to get ahead of things. Where do you think's, you know, weaknesses, where are strengths, what, how you can help this child or how you can help your own marriage and begin to be um, out in front instead of playing, you know, catch up. That has been one of our best pieces of advice. So what Bob is, is, um, gosh, he's amazing. He restores not just homes and properties, but families. And he does, he's just, he's a giver in every way. So I couldn't have done the book because I wouldn't be who I am. <laughs> like right. it wouldn't, um, yeah. I mean, and I joke because he hasn't even read it. He doesn't really read much. It's not that he can't read. Obviously, he can read. He just says, he's like, Ruth, I've lived it. Yeah. So, and I'm always like, but don't you want to read? And he's like, I've, I live it every day. I get your cookies every day. You know, he just isn't one to sit down. Like if yeah. something needs to be done, he does it. If, if someone needs a, a ride to the airport at three in the morning, Bob is there. If 
somebody needs something built at their house, Bob is there. Um, so he's just, to me, has been an example of far more generosity than any person I've ever known. Well, and it, it's got to be amazing to have someone in your corner yeah. who operates without fear. 100%. That's, that is unbelievable 100%. because we, we're we so prone to yeah. hold back, particularly, yeah. you know, big, audacious things yeah. like what, what you've encountered. Mm-hmm. Well, and we started out in one of those meetings that we had together is, okay, we didn't have any children at the time. What do we want our mission statement to be? Who do we want to be as a family? And we wrote those things out. And we set goals as a family every year. Each child did, a spiritual goal, physical goal, and an academic goal. And anyway, we just started to cultivate that kind of a culture within our family. And to have the head of the household be such a part of that, I think, has been... But again, I have have a, a, a single friend who's divorced with children, and I gave her the manuscript originally, and I didn't hear from her for a week, and I thought, oh, no. And she called me at the end of the week and she said, you know, I haven't called you because I've actually gone through a depression a bit, reading it, Mm. knowing and wondering if I've missed the boat or what have I lost. And she said, but what I woke up feeling this morning for the first time is you've given me hope. And it's not over. And again, it goes to C.S. Lewis's statement, which is at the end of my book, that, you know, this is just a shadow of what's to come. Right. And we all yearn for home, which is ultimately heaven. And how can we curate that here? Right. So. Well, I love, and and I've encouraged others to do this, but, you know, when, when we think of sometimes the gap between our relationships with our spouse mm-hmm. and what we would like them to be, and that gap can often seem really large. Insurmountable. Uh-huh. And I love maybe the simple takeaway that you suggested coming from the the Metcalfs to say a great place to begin Mm -hmm. is to once or twice a year get away, just the two of you, and to think, Mm -hmm. to dream, to plan, to center, Mm -hmm. to reconnect. Slow it down. Oh, it's it's so key. And Weezy and I have done that now for, uh, I don't know, 10 12 years. Mm -hmm. And one of the key thoughts that came for me was in that January time when we tend to do this, Mm -hmm. um, the January after our daughter died, Mm -hmm. and we were going through so many grief books. And as a part of that time, and came across this idea of kind of dreaming into our future, mm-hmm. dreaming the future of who we would like to be and what we would like to do from way in the distance. And yeah. so that kind of time, just creating the space for that to happen is sometimes all we need to do. That's it. And, you know, a legacy, again, to that same point of culture, it's your leg- you are going to leave a legacy. So are you being thoughtful for what that will look like as a couple, right. as a family? What do you want the ripple of your home to be? Who do you want to touch? How do you want to touch them? You know, what kind of, um, yeah. And it's not as, as daunting as it might seem because- it's very simple. Uh, as I was talking with one friend, there was a constant theme that was always coming out in his conversation mm-hmm. time after time. And, mm-hmm. and, and as, as I encouraged him to, to that very thing of, you yeah. know, coming up with a family mission statement, some guiding principles, some, guiding some principles. non-negotiables yep. about who your family is. Think about how this word keeps mm-hmm. on, keeps on showing up. And so the, the clues are already there. We're not making it up from scratch. The mm-hmm. clues are already there in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, who we are. So uh, that's 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 great. On um, that, real quick, yeah. in that Bob Goff interview, he said he, Jesus would ask these people that he was healing, "What do you want? What do you want?" And he's like, "Are you asking yourself that? What do I want? What do I want God to do? What do I want to become from God?" You know, we don't yes. ask that enough. 
So. Yeah, and and a lot of times the key to that mm-hmm. is the actual exercise of naming it. Because I yes. think about when when Jesus asked that of the blind man. Mm-hmm. You know, the blind man comes to him and Jesus asks, "What do you want?" And my first reaction is, well, "Why yeah. are you asking that question? <laughs> Isn't it obvious? Isn't, yeah, <laughs> but maybe all he wanted was money. Maybe yeah. he wanted to stay in his yeah. place. But he had to name. This is what, this I, is want. what I want, and that's that mm-hmm. is I'll believe naming is so I powerful. Agree. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Uh, that's that's great. So uh, I love. Perhaps I think we could talk about mm-hmm. so much in this time, uh, but I'd love to for you to share what are to you or mm-hmm. to you and Bob some of the kind of critical regular practices mm-hmm. that you engage in to keep yourself centered. centered. Because everything in our culture is going the opposite direction mm-hmm. of everything in, that book. in your book. Yeah. And, you know, we have five children and five athletes and, I mean, three are college athletes. I mean, it's we are running hard. And there have been times where we have sat down and said, everything stops. Um, Not just for you, your sake as an individual, but us as a family. And so some of the practices are, like I mentioned earlier, we read as a family. Mm -hmm. So we don't all necessarily get to sit down at a dinner table, given swim practice, tennis practice, all those things that are happening. But what we do do is before bed, we're all sitting down and we read. And I read out loud and people, when they were younger, they were doing Legos while I read or, you know, we always have a fire going or out by the fire pit and and doing s'mores. But we read different books, um, whether they're a fiction historical novel to some, you know, Bob Goff's book or any, you know, Tim Tebow's book. I mean, we've done so many, Boys in the Boat. I mean, we've done so many books. But um, what that does is it quiets everybody down for about 20 minutes we read and afterwards it what ends up doing is everyone just relaxes for another 20 minutes and discusses their day or i'll say okay what can i be praying for what's going on this week and we have those conversations but you have to slow it down mm, um, so true you know, i find as parents we are the guilty party they don't know anything better sometimes we're throwing that ipad at that young kid to keep them quiet while we want to do something we want to do so part of the change we have found had to begin with us. One of the things I noticed in your book, I have to mm-hmm. interrupt, but yeah. um, there are a lot of photos, and they are amazing photos. And it seems like they are photos of virtually every nook and cranny of your house. Mm-hmm. I looked through as I was thinking about this to double check myself. Mm-hmm. I did not see a single photo of a TV. I, I, you might have TVs. Right. We and, have and, we have one in our den. Yeah, but it's yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, uh-huh. I don't doubt that. Mm-hmm. But it was so clear that yeah. that wasn't the focal point no. of of your existence. No, and I'm sure you noticed all our artwork. I framed beautifully my kids' artwork when they bring it home from school. I don't care if they're in second grade, but them having that prominent place above the fireplace or. Yeah. You know, it just, it it brought who your family is into the home. But let, let's take, for instance, games. You know, gaming is a problem with boys in particular. And my youngest is a boy, he's 14 now. So we started a rule early on. Guess what? Saturdays until noon, you can play as many, as many games as you want. In fact, you can get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and start gaming till 12. It's done at 12 o'clock. You don't ask me for the rest of the week. So what started as, okay, we'll do 30 minutes a day, which, you know, stretches to two hours a day because you don't pay attention or you're exhausted and you just let it happen. And the nagging, it all ended. Huh. They can get up when they want and they can do their games, but at 12 o'clock, it's over. Well, and of course, uh, as as it shows in the book, mm-hmm. you also have zip lines and go-karts and ping and pong password. tables. I know, and-, and not everybody can have those, and I understand that, yeah. but, but you have access to things or just doing together. We have family right. game nights where one family right. chooses the meal, one child chooses the meal, the other one chooses the games of the night. Yeah. So we have a whole ice cream sundae thing that we put together on this Lazy Susan, and everybody gets to choose their toppings. So it's just being creative. Really, it is spending the time to think about it. Otherwise, time is over like that. Mm-hmm. And you don't think about it. You're too yeah. tired. Yeah. I mean, if I had my druthers, 
I, I wouldn't be doing those things at night. I'm exhausted. Yeah. But I also understand the importance. And when scripture says, with your obedient, he blesses to the thousandth generation, he's serious. And for women who have, you know, get discouraged because they just became a believer or they didn't start out that way, guess what? You get to start it yeah. right now, all yeah. by yourself. That's right. So, Baby steps, mm-hmm. creative steps that fit who you are. Fit who you are. Um, and your home's going to look different than mine. Yeah. Well, I I definitely want to encourage people. This is, uh, even a, even as a male who yeah. isn't really particularly interested <laughs> well, every in recipes. every male knows females, so yeah. it's the perfect gift. <laughs> and, and I'm very appreciative of the recipes in there, particularly the chocolate chip cookies. The chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, uh-huh. exactly. But it's a beautiful book. Thank you. Uh, Hungry, for home, Hungry for Home, A Year Together at Hillside Farm. And it's so much more than just about even hospitality or homemaking. It, it's about creating, as you say, Family. a culture mm-hmm. in which the right things happen, a culture of quiet, a culture of intimacy and relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think you've heard this before. I was asked by one interviewer, what do you say to the people who think you have a perfect home? Which actually made me incredibly sad when she asked that. And my response was, I, haven't, I don't have a perfect home. What I've wanted to do is create a safe place to not be perfect in. And that Perfect. is what I hope I've given my children yeah. and to anyone who walks in the door. Hmm. But um, yeah, you can also look at Hungry for Home Instagram. I give tips each week on different things. Yes. So, so your fun. Instagram is yep, Hungry for Home. Hungry for Home. <laughs> and right. the website is Hungry for Home with the number four. Okay. But, um, and is this available on Amazon? It's, a, it's available on Amazon and on my website. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other Places, ways to connect. No, oh, just Instagram, probably. Well, uh, when God gives you the next bigger vision than you can <laughs> accomplish, I'll bring you back on. I would love it. <laughs> I can't wait, Thank I can't you. wait well, to when, hear what that's If God about. tells you what my next plan is, then you can tell me how that. I already did. You need to run a podcast. I would love it, but oh my uh, goodness. How would I get people to come on my podcast? Uh, we'll see. I can <laughs> up with that. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank uh, you. Thanks so much, Ruth. It's just it. been a great joy. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. <laughs>